Excellent. Welcome, welcome. Thank you all for joining. Uh, my name is Julia Shoshnik. My pronouns are she, her, hers. And I'm the creative producer here at HowlRound Theater Commons. Um, to give you a brief visual description, I am a light-skinned Latino woman with dark brown wavy hair, wearing gold hoop earrings and a light blue button-down shirt. And I am so thrilled to welcome you to today's virtual TCG session, creating accessible and values-driven multimedia content. It's one of those titles that says exactly what we're gonna talk about today, which is great. Um, I wanna say a huge thank you to the TCG organizing committee for your support in bringing this together. Um, we are live streaming straight to HowlRound TV, HowlRound.com. Um, so welcome to all of you for tuning in. We're so happy you're here. Um, before we continue, I'd like to offer a land acknowledgement. Um, at HowlRound, we hold ourselves accountable to the work of undoing oppression and advancing equity to overcome this country's bitter history of segregation and racial inequality. Um, as part of this work, we must start by acknowledging that HowlRound operates on the ancestral and unceded lands of the Massachusetts people, whose name was appropriated by this commonwealth. We pay respect to the Massachusetts elders, past, present, and future, the traditional custodians of the lands on which we make and present our art. We acknowledge the truth of violence perpetrated in the name of this country and make a commitment to uncovering that truth through dialogue, partnerships, and learning. And additionally, I'd like to share a digital land acknowledgement that was created by Adrian Wong of Spiderweb Show. Uh, since our discussion today is shared digitally to the internet, let's also take a moment to consider the legacy of colonization embedded within the technologies, structures, and ways of thinking we use every day. We are using equipment and high-speed internet not available in many indigenous communities. Even the technologies that are central to much of the art that we make leave significant carbon footprints, contributing to changing climates that disproportionately affect indigenous peoples worldwide. So I invite you to join me in acknowledging the truth of violence perpetrated in the name of this country, as well as our shared responsibility to uncovering that truth through dialogue, partnerships, and learning. Thank you. Um, and before we continue and I invite in my panelists, I just want to say a few words about HowlRound for those of you who are unfamiliar. Um, HowlRound is a free and open platform for theater makers worldwide. We amplify progressive and disruptive ideas about theater and connect diverse practitioners like the ones we have here with us today. Uh, we envision a theater field where resources and power are shared equitably, equitably in all directions, contributing to a more just and sustainable world. Um, and some of the ways we do that, we have an online journal where artists share their thinking and a live streaming television network called HowlRound TV um, for fieldwide discussions and events. Uh, in addition to this work, we produce convenings. We partner with the Latinx Theater Commons, co-manage the National Playwright Residency Program with the Mellon Foundation, and support the International Presenting Commons. Just a few things that we do. Um, and to kind of set the scene for today's session, I was thinking about um, what HowlRound could kind of offer at TCG this year. And I was really thinking about how HowlRound's ethos kind of connects and engages with our increasingly remote field. Um, and at this conference, conference, we've heard from a few of our colleagues about kind of what can we offer as theater practitioners beyond Zoom plays? Um, you know, I was thinking about what are the different ways to engage with our field, disrupt our field, expand our field around the globe. Um, and at HowlRound, we really aim to do that by platforming content that challenges the way we think about theater and connect and learn through this artic artistic practice. Um, to explore how to do this, I'm really excited to bring in our brilliant panelists for today. I'm joined by two HowlRound staff members who help bring our content from conception to publication and four fantastic HowlRound contributors who have created really impactful iterative content um, across three different media types, which is great. Um, and I said this to them, I'm gonna say it to you all, that I think each of them could have just a fantastic session that highlights their work individually, but I am really excited to hear how their work um, really like shines in conversation with each other. Um, so with that, I'm gonna pass the mic to my colleagues, Ramona and Vijay to introduce themselves with their names, pronouns, a brief visual description and professional affiliation at HowlRound. I will pass to you, Ramona. Awesome, hi everybody. Um, I'm Ramona Rose King. My pronouns are she, her, hers. I am the Digital Content and Communications Manager here at HowlRound. Um, and I am a white woman uh, with glasses and dark hair, wearing a pink shirt. Um, I'm sitting in front of a beige wall and I will ask Julia to say something for me in the chat. Fantastic, thank you, Ramona. Um, and 
Ronnie said, say something for you in the chat. I just want to make sure I'm saying the right thing for you. Yeah, there we go. Okay. Sorry. Um, I just, I also want to say, I'm unfortunately calling in from a public place. I, um, uh, in the spirit of transparency, I am pregnant. I had a midwife appointment this morning and didn't have time to make it uh, home to my office. So I apologize if there's background noise when I'm speaking. Thank you all. Look at the dedication of the HowlRound team. That's so beautiful. And Arona's pregnant, pregnant. We're about to have a new HowlRound team member very soon. So thank you. And our panelists are calling in from so many places. So we're very excited. So thank you, Ramona. You sound great. So we're all good. And I will pass to you, Vijay. Hi, everyone. My name is Vijay Matthew. My pronouns are he, him. And the visual description is I have short black hair. I'm wearing glasses with clear frames and a black shirt behind a white background. And I am uh, HowlRound's cultural strategist and a co-founder of HowlRound. Thank you, Vijay. Back. And Vijay is really like the OG brains behind all of this. And I think we always talk about you, Vijay, as like embodying the values of the commons and everything you do. So I'm super excited to have you both here. Um, and with that, I'll pass to our wonderful HowlRound contributors who are here. And if you can introduce yourselves by name, pronouns, um, brief visual description, and then brief overview of the series that you're going to talk about today with us. And I can pass to you, Daphne, to start. Hello, everyone. My name is Daphne Seacray. Um, I use she, her, ella pronouns. And um, I am sitting at the beach with a blurred background. And I have big um, glasses on, curly hair, and some hoops, and just really enjoying being in the space and smiling about it. Um, I'm an artistic, co-artistic director with Ammunition Theater, and I'm also a college professor moving from one institution to another. So I'm you know, very excited about the changes that are coming along. And again, I will pass it to Chantal. Hi, everyone. My name is Chantal Biloto. I use she, her pronouns. Um, I am a white woman wearing uh, glasses with dark frames. Uh, I have my hair, dark hair in a ponytail and a white, in a, sorry, in a blue t-shirt. And I'm sitting in front of a mess of books uh, behind me. Um, I am the curator of the Theater in the Age of Climate Change uh, essay series on HowlRound. And I will pass it to Jordan. Hello, everyone. I'm Jordan Ely. Um, pronouns are they, them, and she, her. Um, visual description, I am a light-skinned Black femme with uh, tortoiseshell glasses, hoops, and curly hair. I feel like that sounds like all of us right now. We're like, we all have curly hair, glasses, and hoops. Um, but yes. <laughs> and I'm wearing a, a blue uh, top um, and a gold necklace. Um, and I am an assistant professor at the University of Rochester, but um, for this panel, um, my expertise lies in being the co-host of Daughters of Lorraine, and I will pass it along to my collaborator. Thank you, Jordan. Hello, everyone. My name is Leticia Ritley. I use she, they pronouns. My vis uh, visual description is that I have black locks that go down to my ears um, black framed glasses and I'm wearing a green forest shirt color sweater uh, with a blurred background that's just my kitchen <laughs> and I am one half of uh, Daughters of Lorraine co-hosts co-creators and co-producers we pretty much do a little bit of everything fantastic thank you I'm going to pop back to you Daphne so you can say what series you're here yes, I forgot. Um, I I created the Afro Latine uh, playwriting series last year. Very excited about that. Fantastic! Thank you all. You all are so cool and do such incredible work. And I heard you say, Jordan, uh, your assistant professor, but also daughters of Lorraine. And I think it's an and because I think you all do such incredible work, really around the world. And I love how it informs the series that we're going to talk about today. So thank you all so much for making the time to be here. Um, I'm gonna kind of give a bit of an overview of why I invited each of you here to be a part of this session in particular. Um, so as you heard, Daphne, Chantal, Jordan, and Leticia all have um, 
really created and curated a different series on HowlRound. I think for some of you, it's been over years and years. Some of them is a little more short form. Um, and it's all in different types of content that we offer at HowlRound. So we have Chantal, who has curated um, an essay series, Jordan and Leticia, who are the creators of a podcast series, and Daphne, who created a live stream series. Um, so it's really exciting to kind of be able to showcase the different ways that we um, platform our message on HowlRound. Um, and particularly, I think what's interesting as series curators versus kind of one-off content contributors, which we often do at HowlRound and is great as well. Um, I'm excited that you can all speak to kind of the process of not only generating compelling content, but identifying and bringing in other change makers in the field to design really rich written content, audio content, and live content that Daphne, you could speak to as well. Um, and because your work is iterative over time, like Chantal, you have so many years <laughs> creating your series, which is so fantastic. Um, I'm excited to kind of pull from you all the ways that you your series have been able to respond to the field, but also how you been able to watch your skill set grow in creating the type of content that you do across these different um, media types. Um, so I'm excited to get into all of that. To zoom out a little bit, um, would love to just share, how do we get to a published series at HowlRound? You know, what does it really look like to go from idea to editing, to curating, and to actually sharing it uh, with our audience? Um, so with that, um, we'll share that our all of our HowlRound content really comes from our community. Um, and we curate that according to our HowlRound values. And we curate that by listening to our contributors and doing that you know, in a conversation. Um, so there's a great, really rigorous editing and curation process that happens at HowlRound in conversation with our contributors and our community at large. Um, and no one can speak to that better really than Ramona and Vijay who are here and that's why I've invited them in. So I'd love to pass to you, Ramona, if you can speak a little bit to what is that typical process at HowlRound to go from concepts to editing to publication. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I'll talk primarily about the journal. Um, so journal series typically come to us like all our content does um, through the contribute content form on our website. Um, so we meet weekly as a full staff to evaluate all of these submissions um, for essays, series, live streams, um, and podcasts when we are accepting podcast uh, proposals. Um, and we decide whether they're a good fit for our platform based primarily on alignment with our values, like Julia said. Um, if things don't come to us through this open form with series proposals in particular, um, they often come through pre-existing relationships with com contributors or community members. Um, so folks who we've already been in conversation with around other projects or perhaps one-off content, um, often that relationship will evolve then into a, a series. Um, and when a series is accepted, we work then with the curator to finalize three to four additional contributors um, who will be writing essays. So our typical essay series are four to five total uh, pieces. Um, then the curator works with the writers to prepare drafts. Uh, when we get those drafts, they go to one of our fabulous editors um, who work with the writers on form, argument, clarity, voice, um, as well as editing, uh, copy editing the piece and, and putting it um, to our style guide. Um, so, you know, it's a lot of work. Uh, the typical turnaround time between um, seri a series to go from idea to publication is anywhere from three to six months or more. Um, and, uh, you know, the fact that we have someone like Chantal who's been willing to do it so many times <laughs> um, over the years, you know, to engage in this deep process sort of over and over again and on such an important topic um, is really just such a gift. And um, we've been so honored to platform and amplify her work in this way, uh, just as we have, you know, for everyone here um, and so many others. But I'll let Vijay speak a little bit more to the, to the TV and, and podcast processes. Yeah, for uh, HowlRound TV, uh, in a year we have about 120 events, uh, live streams, um, that come from about 70 to 80, um, mostly organizations. Uh, and it's um, 70, 80 organizations, so meaning there's some organizations that will do series of live streams. And, um, and that's a big difference from the journal in that of course, it's individuals who are writing for the journal, um, and uh, 
for HowlRound TV, it's organizations who are usually creating an event um, for their local community or local network. And they're partnering or publishing their live streams with HowlRound as a way to amplify to multiple other networks out there, networks of people, of practitioners. Um, and we do have though individual artists or individual people who may not be affiliated with an organization that's um, organizing a live stream, um, who then may have an idea for a series that would be um, specific to a particular uh, community. Um, and that was the case of uh, Daphne's uh, series on, on HowlRound, um, the, in which we'll talk about more. Um, and what we do in terms of um, how, how these ideas come in, it's through our contribute content page. And, um, and if the event is aligned with our editorial agenda or our, our larger HowlRound values, then we figure out how, what, what the needs are of that organization are in terms of, um, do they need particular kind of technical consulting in figuring out pre-production for their live stream, whether or not it's gonna be an in-person live stream from a venue, or if it's gonna be an all virtual live stream like what we're doing right now, uh, which is a video conference that's then being sent to our uh, live stream destination. So we will work with the organization on that. And then um, also um, if they're not um, budgeted for accessibility um, services such as sign language interpretation or live captioning, uh, we'll also help project manage that for them um, and help them to figure out a budget for that. Um, and then um, the live stream happens and then we'll archive the video by publishing it publicly uh, to HowlRound, and um, and then there it's it's uh, it's kept it's searchable um, uh, permanently, and um, and so yeah that's the that's the kind of outline of the process for for HowlRound TV. Uh, for podcasts, we're able to support um, much less in terms of um, quantity of episodes. At the most, it's about forty episodes total in a year that we're able to publish. And that um, comes to about four podcast shows or series in a year that we're able to support. And um, podcasts are are very intense in terms of the time, work, and preparation that the podcast producers um, need. And, um, and so that kind of accounts also for uh, why we publish less uh, podcasts. And um, also in terms of technical production, um, most if not all of that is taken care of by the podcast host or peer producers. Uh, and, um, and so our role is in this case is really uh, more as um, I guess compared to journal and TV, the podcast is um, really us as being the final destination, the, the podcast publisher and we take care of that side of things as well as the communications around um, new episodes coming out, putting it on social media in our newsletter, and um, and then just maintaining um, these shows um, so that they're permanently available um, to folks, um, both on HowlRound as well as to external podcast directories. Yeah, so I'll hand it back to you, Julia. Fantastic, thank you, Vijay. I'm really excited about this in particular because I can hear exactly how that works and then pass it to the people that are doing it from the other side of the actual submission and pitch process. So um, you gave a nice little segue there, Vijay, and ending with podcasts. So I wonder, Jordan and Leticia, if I can pass to you, what's the Daughters of Lorraine origin story from Idea to HowlRound? And I, I love this story. I guess I'll take it since Jordan's not unmuting. Um, so <laughs> the way that Daughters of Lorraine really got started was I was in graduate school uh, or we both were in graduate school and I had a, a yeah, I'm sorry, Jordan. I forgot it's been so long ago. Um, and I was taking a class about the digital humanities and one of the assignments was to create a podcast and I did not want to do it alone. I, I'm not really a fan of the sort of like one person talking to a mic and there's like no engagement. 
And at the time, Jordan was my roommate. And I was like, hey, I have this assignment that you're also going to do with me. And Jordan kind of just agreed to it. And we did an episode about, what was it? Uh, Beyonce's Homecoming had just uh, been put up on Netflix. So we were talking about remediation and, and how the different forms exist. And then from there, we realized like, oh man, we have actually pretty good chemistry when we're on the mic together. And Jordan was the one that was like, we should just actually really start a podcast. Like Jordan came up with the name and everything. Um, and then from there, you know, Jordan's the one that's more, takes initiative more in the sense that Jordan was like, I'm putting a proposal together right now for HowlRound and like put a proposal and sent it off. And then next thing you know, we get an email uh, back from Ramona and really excited about uh, what we had proposed. And then from there, it just kind of like took off. Like we had no time to kind of sort of stop and be like, wait, can we actually do this? Why we are like pursuing our PhDs? Who cares? We're going to figure it out anyways. I don't know if you want to add anything, Jordan. No, you pretty much covered it. And, and I will say like at the time too, um, it also seemed like, um, it it was a good time for HowlRound um, for us when we reached out to, because I like in our initial meeting with Ramona, she mentioned wanting to diversify the content in the podcasting realm at that time. And they were like, you know, since HowlRound is a community oriented space where everything comes in through people's proposals, they were like, maybe we're gonna have to start doing some outreach to see if anyone's interested to like actually be able to produce a podcast from the like a different perspective than what we currently offer in that in that realm. And so then it was just kind of like Kismet where I like have put together this thing and and all of a sudden we were you know, like Leticia said, hit the ground running pretty much immediately. Um don't listen to our first episode. Part of the archive. It's important. And it is. I'll get into this later, but like I, I'm excited to hear about just the growth. Like the idea that you can go from maybe we should do this thing to now, you know, like seasons of this. And it's informed not only um, I, you know, I imagine your own work, but how rounds visibility in our podcasting space. So thank you for that. I'll pass to we can take it all the way back, maybe Chantal, if you can tell us your origin story. Yeah, I don't remember all of the details, but I know it was a conversation with, with Vijay as part of a conference um, that was taking place in New York. And um, so this is like almost 10 years ago, I think it was 2015. And um, I was part of a session that was about the intersection of theater and climate. And I asked Vijay if anybody had written a series about that. And um, he said, no, and I don't remember if you were doing a lot of series back then or not. Um, so I, yeah, I proposed doing a series. And then after I did one, I was like, wait, can we do that more than once? <laughs> and so for many years, um, I did it twice a year and, and now I'm back to just doing it once a year. But this was at a time where um, almost nobody was talking about this intersection and I felt like we needed this conversation to happen. And so it was so um, generous and maybe forward looking of uh, HowlRound to uh, agree to do this because um, it was just fair, it was still fairly new and um, in many ways looked down upon, like this was not something that was going to make for good theater. So I was, I was and still am grateful to be able to bring artists who engage with climate on the HowlRound platform. You're really like, your series is as old as HowlRound in so many ways. So it's such a great way to track, I think just the, the journey of HowlRound and our editorial voice. So thank you for that. And again, for all of you, like your work, I've been at HowlRound for a year now and your work was sort of, it's my understanding of what HowlRound is. And I think that's true for so many people. Daphne, you want to close us out with your origin story? Sure. But even before that, I just want to um, acknowledge, like, it's so exciting to be in the space with y'all, especially because, like, as a college professor, I have used your work in my classes with my students. And so, like, I think it's so important to know that, like, this work, yes, it exists in HowlRound, but it also, it's this educational work that I've been able to, you know, and and I love using it to be like, as a, you know, be like, here's a great resource. And let me tell you, students love the HowlRound articles because 
they're accessible, they can read them, they understand them, and they love podcasts. Like students prefer a podcast <laughs> the reading assignment and they take so much of it. And so it's just really just, I just wanted both of you to know that in my classes, I've used both of you, you know, both of the creations of this and it just is so wonderful. And so um, to talk about the Super Friends, um, so I, I created, I curated the Afro-Latina Super Friends Happy Hour, and um, but it's not my original idea. So the original re idea came from Tabla Rivas, who during the pandemic was like, we've got to do something um, and have some representation for Latinidad. And so he curated, I think he gathered almost 20 people. I don't know, it's crazy. But it was the same sort of, it was the same format where um, it was live streamed. It was also on Zoom and it's archived. So you could sign up in advance. You'd get a link. And during the pandemic, people were just desperate. And he was able to bring in all these Latina playwrights to basically give a masterclass for an hour on playwriting. And so after he finished it, he sort of curated what he did. I think he spent like fall. And then he was like, he put out a call and he said, I need someone else to take this over. <laughs> and so I reached out and I said, I was like, I'd love to take it over, but I'd want to focus on Afro-Latinidad and have specifically Afro-Latina playwrights. And he was like, sounds amazing. Go for it. All yours, Dad. Which I think it's also important to know and hear that like, um, and also because I know them and and he, you know, he said, I, I would like someone to take this on, that you could get inspiration from other folks and that you can build on some of these sort of projects. And so I knew I wanted to focus, focus on Afro Latinidad because that's the research I do in academia. That's what I publish on. And I know a ton of Afro Latina playwrights. And so for me, it was really um, great to be like, OK, I'm going to create a series. I'm going to pick eight different playwrights, um, you know, continue this series, but revamp it change it, have a different focus, but still keep it the same format of on Zoom, people are in the room with you, live stream, and then also gets archived. You just said the magic word that I was going to use to segue us, which is archive, archival, archiving. It's such a, um, I, I think about this with, I think your series, each function as archives of the particular, um, like I think corners of our field that we really aim to, to platform at HowlRound. Um, and I think HowlRound itself, I kind of view as an archive. And I'm curious, um, I think Ramona, I'm just curious to hear like from the editorial perspective, how do you kind of see that HowlRound's function as an archive? Yeah, absolutely. I'd say I see it in um, maybe in two main ways. I mean, for one, you know, like Daphne uh, already spoke so beautifully to Thank you for lifting, you know, bringing content into your classroom. That is something that we hear repeatedly from uh, from our um, from our community survey that we do yearly, and just from you know meeting people in the field about how they really appreciate the sort of openness and accessibility of hell around content um, in their classrooms, in their research. Uh, you know, folks who are starting out um, and don't maybe have any access or even knowledge of, um, you know, scholarly journals or uh, more sort of traditional academic publishing spaces can still find access to, um, to this information, you know, about current uh, contemporary practices in theater and now not so contemporary practices, right? Like what people were doing, not many, many, many years ago, except for in a couple of cases where we've tackled theater history, but certainly 12, 15 years ago. Um, and that's sort of my other favorite way to think about the HowlRound archive uh, or the HowlRound, you know, content bases as a way of tracing conversations over time. Um, you know, Chantal, for example, like in your series, we still call it theater in the age of climate change, right? But I think when we, uh, when it started out, you know, people were really using, right, climate change, global warming, like those were sort of the words, you know, now in this most recent installment, we see more folks using terms like climate emergency, right, or polycrisis, sort of acknowledging the um, the new understanding of the scale <laughs> um, of of what we're dealing with. Um, I also think about it a lot in terms of conversations around gender. Um, in the early days of of HowlRound, there were so many pieces of content around gender parity, right? 
uh, we use that word, that term parity is that there's two, right? <laughs> like one thing equal to another thing. Um, and many of those pieces did move the field forward, right? When HowlRun started, it was like semi-acceptable to program a season of all like cis male playwrights, you know? Um, and it's like kind of just not anymore. Um, but it's interesting to see the way the language has evolved from things like gender parity to gender diversity, right? And recognizing that there's like so much more of a spectrum um, of identity and that we we can't speak about it as a binary. And so we can't use that word parity anymore. Uh, yeah, so that's, that's uh, those are some of the ways that I think about it. Yeah, thank you. I'm curious for you, um, I think Leticia and Jordan, I'm curious about kind of how does that, that impulse of archiving, the importance of archiving, how does that fit into your curation process or even I think the concept overall for the podcast? Yeah, this is a really great, um, that's a really great question. Um, I think going into it, you know, Leticia and I being such a fan of just podcasts in general, um, was the really big draw for us to start the podcast. And so when we were doing it, we didn't think of ourselves as archivists. Like we were really just like, you know, we'd go see a play and we'd deconstruct it for hours, like on the ride home, in the apartment, in the classroom, in the offices at, in our school. Um, and we were thinking about like, if we're hungry for this kind of conversation, perhaps there are other people who are hungry for that conversation. And I think also, again, we're not critics, like our podcast is not necessarily about that, but we do notice that there's a dearth of theater criticism that engages black playwrights and their work. Um, and, and so we also saw it as a space for us to be able to uplift contemporary black theater that may not be getting coverage from the big news outlets. Um, and, and stuff like that. And so, and we also were situated at the time in Washington, DC, which is an underrated theater market, an absolutely underrated theater market. If any of you DCers are out there watching this, like we love DC. DC embraced us so much as podcasters and as the members of the theater community. And so like, we wouldn't have Daughters of Lorraine if there wasn't such amazing theater happening in that space. like bar none um but and so I think that now as we are looking kind of, like we're kind of we're we're we, we'd be doing our like fifth season I think right Leticia oh my goodness um and so like as we're looking back and thinking and looking back at all of the work that the people we've been able to talk to the work we've been able to cover it is starting to serve as this archive of of contemporary black theater in a, in a really interesting way. Um, you know, we're talking to people like Procled, we're talking to Terrell Alvin McCraney as he's starting his artistic director, you know, position at the Geffen, you know, like we are capturing what we're starting to see as like pretty monumental moments in black theater, especially in the contemporary space. And so, um, it's a good time, I think, for us to look back at that work. I mean, even I remember our first episode, which don't listen to it, but if you do listen to it, it's about Fairview um, by Jackie Sibley's jury, who when we tweeted the episode was like, her tweet to us was like, yes, black women critics, like on, you know, on in theater or something like something of the sort. And it was, you know, that tweet and that like, you know, acknowledgement that, yeah, it just speaks to the need of, I mean, this is the Pulitzer Prize winning playwright who's like, yes, people, Black women engaging my work, you know, and so I, I think that that's kind of how we're thinking about, like, starting to think of ourselves as contributing to this archive. Latisse, I don't know if you want to add some more stuff. I'll just add that it's also baked into the podcast itself. We didn't want to close down the opportunity for the podcast to speak to, like, multiple temporalities right so we do have what we call black theater 
history episodes where we try to place it in conversation, right? Because we we see that history as important and connect it to the work that we do on more contemporary Black theater. So I think that, you know, when, when we probably look back at our, our episodes, we're like, oh, you know, when Roe v. Wade got overturned, we were like, we need to do an episode about how reproductive justice in Black theater has been talked about um, and how it continues to be talked about, right? So I think just archiving also, like Jordan mentioned, moments in time and how uh, black theater has responded to them has been something that I think about a lot and I'm I'm hopeful like after we are long gone or decide to stop doing the podcast that something like this will exist for folks um, to look back at and, and listen to and think about um, how black theater has grown and changed over time I think is just something that I really cherish. I also want to say too with those history episodes is that like also, we find that some of the people we talk about are not even people that have been written about even in the academic space or like have not been paid attention to in 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 particular ways, even within, you know, traditional theater history. So it's like we're we're doing the contemporary stuff, but we're also saying like, no, this this black feminist playwright has passed on and not many people have has engaged engaged her work. And so we want to make sure that an accessible space like a podcast episode can exist about her so that some student who is a nerd like me and Leticia were when we were 18 years old in college is going to listen to that and be like, oh my God, I need to read everything I, everything there is to know about Robbie McCauley. And, and hopefully that that also contributes to legacy. Absolutely. I'm, I'm thinking about all, like this idea of archive that each one of I think the like each episode or or essay um, or live stream in your series is an archive in itself, but also the idea of this long form archive that you can kind of watch your corner of the field grow by looking back at all the past you know, submissions. And I'm curious for you, Chantal, in particular, just because you have the longest <laughs> series here. Um, have you been able to track kind of this like change in the field through your work? Anything kind of surprising through there? Um, the field has definitely changed and, um, you know, it's hard to know how much, uh, the series contributed to, to it and how much is the zeitgeist. Um, it certainly c contributed. Um, I don't think it was the only thing, but when, when I started, um, I remember the, maybe the first couple of series after the first couple of series, I had sort of exhausted everybody I knew who <laughs> was working at that intersection and, um, it was, you know, I had to go looking to find other people. Now it's not, you know, there are a lot of um, playwrights, theater makers who are concerned with the climate crisis. And so it's more of a matter of um, looking how I can uh, create something cohesive with each series. Um, another thing that has changed, I think, also is um, when we started there was more of a, it was, it was a little less specific. So we were all dealing with climate change as this big umbrella. Um, and now, you know, people will be concerned with uh, forest fire in a particular area or food deserts or so it has, you know, it has trick and, trickled down to more specific problems that um, various theater makers are addressing. Um, and I wanted to say one thing also, which is um, I think a big strength of HowlRound is that there, it it's not um, practitioners don't have a lot of places where they can express themselves and reflect on their own work. Um, typically, it's academics who will reflect on practitioners' work, and um, I, you know I like that because when people write about my work, I'm like, oh, I don't think I knew that. Um, so it's always um, interesting and surprising what they see in it versus what I think I put in it. But also, I, I also think it's really important for practitioners to be able to define themselves and talk about their own work. And um, how long is a wonderful place to do that? Thank you for saying that. That's a beautiful way of um, thinking about, I think, this just curation and platforming process overall is this space for reflection. I think what you were saying too, Jordan, of a space to uplift voices and create that pathway for other people to find those voices. Um, and I'm curious for you all, what is that? You know, we talked about with, with your series, but what I'm excited to, you know, platform here is that you're bringing in other voices into your series. What is that curation process like for you all? And I can start with you, Daphne, of 
how do you kind of find those new voices to bring in and and you know connect them to the the change you're trying to make through your series? Yeah, as a practitioner and an academic, it's interesting because I often have to think about I think a lot about accessibility, and then I also write. Um, I'm one of the few scholars that are writing about Afro Latinidad in theater within the U.S. context, and um, it's hard because when you are you know want to submit a journal article in certain academic spaces, they'll be like, where's the archive? And you're like, I'm the archive, <laughs> it doesn't exist. And so that's really hard. And so I'm very cognizant of that when it comes to um, the work that we do and uh, curating in the spaces. And so for my series, I was very, I said, okay, I have eight playwrights I wanna pick. I really wanna think about um, the beautiful complexities and diversity within Afro Latinidad and being very cognizant about that. So I was very cognizant about age and who I was bringing into the picture. I was very cognizant about people's um, nationality um, as Afro Latina folks, like how, what is their country of origin? Um, I was also very um, specific in picking where people lived so that I wasn't just picking people that were in New York. And so being very cognizant of like, can I bring someone from all over? Can I bring folks from all over the country? And that's the beautiful thing also about HowlRound and doing sort of a, a, a series and a live stream series is that I can bring in anyone from anywhere in the country or outside the country. One of the folks actually happened to be in the Dominican Republic when they were um, when they were presenting and during their sort of series. So being very cognizant of like, and y'all mentioned it, what is not out there? What needs to be out there? And um, I am so sorry, there's some choppers coming by. That's what happens when you're outside. And another beautiful thing about live streaming, right? Like this, the beautiful things that happen. Um, but again, very, very cognizant that like, if I am creating something that's gonna be archived, I want to make sure that I'm also cre letting people know different sorts of types of representations. Then the additional layer to that, um, the curating eight playwrights is that I don't want these eight playwrights talking about the same thing because each class is like a master class. And so what are they doing it on? And so again, having discussions with them, I'm like, can you talk about this? Can you talk about this? But also, what do you, what do you want to talk about? What are you interested in? Because that's also really important. I don't want to dictate and tell the playwright this, this, and this, but also being very cognizant, like, oh yeah, I already have one person that's doing solo performance. I already have one person that's doing adaptations. I already have, you know, and how do we engage in this sort of conversation? But being very um, critical of knowing what isn't out there and knowing that this is going to be out there was really important to me. And I've sort of, I, I find all of this um, to be also another way of creating um, accessible materials for academia and for me all of this like whether it's writing articles for the uh, for how round journal whether it's a podcast to me all of these are examples of different ways of publications also um and teaching as i said earlier and so again being very cognizant of all of that um because i i'm so tired of like the word right the word, written word being what is valued in certain places but to me, how much more important it is that someone can see the live stream that we're creating, that a kid in the middle of wherever can literally log on and spend eight hours taking master classes from Afro Latina playwrights, right? That look like that, you know, maybe look like him and they've never known. And then the other beautiful thing is that now also people are introduced to these eight playwrights and you can be going and Google them and look at their work and uh, purchase their work, produce their work, all of that as well. Thank you, Daphne. I'm curious, there's um, the curation process for you and then Leticia and Jordan, there's a similarity there because Daphne, you're on that spectrum of like, it's a live event that you're kind of handing the mic over for what you were doing. And then Jordan and Leticia are kind of like right in between. And obviously Chantal, you're on the other, like this is a, you know, curated and edited. Um, but Jordan and Leticia, what is that kind of curation process like for you where you're bringing someone in and setting up a conversation that you want to be engaging and live, but also curated. How does that work for you, for Daughters of Lorraine? I think for Daughters of Lorraine, me and Jordan found out early, early on in the process that we needed to divvy up responsibilities. So Jordan is very much more um, attached to sort of the planning process. While of course we have conversations about who we're gonna bring on and I'm more of the sort of technical 
brains of the operation. So I'll make sure audio is good. I'll make sure I do the editing for the podcast and things like that. But I think when we were thinking about planning out a season, it's always been about um, one reflecting on what's important to us, right? Or, or, or things that are going on around us that we feel like you know, Black the Air has something to say about it. And when we're inviting contributors, one, we're like, who do we selfishly want to interview and, and talk with? Because like, this is such a great opportunity that we have a conversation with like Pearl freaking Clegg, which is like ridiculous. And and she told us on the podcast that she's a daughter of, she's also a daughter of Lorraine and I almost passed out. Um, but I think a lot of it has to just be like, is it right for how we sort of see that season going? We're thinking a lot about what it means um, for these episodes to be in conversation with each other. We don't want it to be necessarily repetitive with information, but we want there to be some sort of linkages so people don't feel like, you know, they're, they can't necessarily, like they don't, we don't want them to feel like it's like just like thrown together and there's no sort of cohesion. So we sort of think about that a lot. And then when we are working with someone else, we have a series of questions that we send to them beforehand. But we also let all our, you know, contributors who who join the podcast know like, hey, we want this to be a low stakes environment. I think one of the powers of Daughters of Lorraine is you're going to get what you get. Like, this is how Jordan and I talk when we're not, well, we probably teach like this too, but we're, this is how we talk when we're just like hanging out with each other. So we want to sort of capture that sitting at a kitchen table, just chatting about theater and life um, and and allowing the conversation to flow where it flows. Jordan? Yeah, I, yep, everything you said. And it's also, I think it's about like, um, we also, again, want to make sure that we are uplifting what is currently also playing. And so, you know, we we slot in a certain amount of uh, episodes per season to talk about a show that is currently running. Um, and if possible, we try to also do collaborations with the theater itself to make sure that, you know, they know that we're going to do this episode. And sometimes they are like, oh, let's, you know, let's have an episode dedicated or we can, you know, talk to the playwright or the director or someone involved with the show. And then sometimes it's just a matter of like, they'll post it on their Instagram or something say like, oh, this, uh, this podcast has covered this or, or whatnot. So we also try to use it um, as a space to promote black theater too. Like we're, we're not necessarily, we're not like influencers, right? You're not black theater influencers, although. If anyone's ever interested, <laughs> we we'd be we'd be open to a conversation. No, I'm just kidding. Um, but it's more so of just like we want to make sure that these shows are being seen. I mean, a huge part of the reason why we do the work that we do is because we want this to always be an uplifting space for contemporary and historical Black theater and performance. And so if this is gonna potentially not that you know I don't want to overstate our impact, but like if this is going to open up an opportunity or like someone who's never heard of a particular playwright or it's a new play that no, you know, whatever, then folks, we want this to be an opportunity for people to be like, oh, I didn't know that, that was even happening or I didn't even know that that play was currently running or I've never even heard of this playwright. But that sounds like something that would be really interesting to me. Um, then it's great to have that. So I think the curation process also is driven by what's currently happening and and what we can also get to feasibly like now we live in two different countries <laughs> we were we were by coastal for a while and now we're <laughs> we're technically only three like three hours away really right like um technically but you know now we're opening up into a totally different market with uh leticia living living in an entirely different cultural context and so i think that that also has shifted the way we think about curation because now we're kind of thinking more globally is like, okay, what does that, how does that shape, you know, our African-American perspectives into like, you know, a whole different theater market, like whether it is in Montreal or whether it is in Toronto or, you know, in, in London, like how does that then open up the, the space of what black theater is? So I think we're kind of in a transitional mode too, when we're thinking about what we're going to, what it's going to look like. Yes, global collaboration. I mean, that's like all I hope for on Halloween. I love that you've all spoken to that, which is incredible. I'm curious for you, Chantal, um, what that's like or what that has been like for you, because I think for your series, it's a little different in that you are kind of just passing the mic for each essay within the series and you help kind of curate 
who those voices are and how they're fitting in with each other. But what's that curation process like for you? Um, it's interesting hearing um, Jordan and Leticia talk about how they can maybe feature something that's going on right now. Cause I'm like, oh yeah, no, I can only do it after the fact because nobody has time to work on an essay <laughs> when they're in the middle of doing something. Um, so yeah, so it's always a, a reflection of something that has happened. Um, and uh, I, so for as long as I've been working on this series I keep a running list, you know, somewhere. Cause every time I, I think I come across an interesting project or meet somebody interesting. I'm like, okay, this could maybe be in a series down the line. So I have this running list and, you know, sometimes people will stay on the list for a while because um, I'm trying, like it was said before, I'm trying to create something that's cohesive and, you know, maybe it's not the right fit or maybe it would repeat what somebody else is doing. And then eventually it's the right fit. And I approach them and ask them to contribute to the series. Um, I, it's been uh just because some of the work I do is very international. So the series has been international from the beginning. Um, and uh, and then these people then lead me to other people, the people who contribute then lead me to other contributors. So that's how it continues um, to evolve. And um, now I've recently, I've been thinking about um, and trying to find people who who do in fact address the climate crisis in their work but might not call it that way um because uh i've been very vocal from the beginning just because i felt that nobody was doing it and i wanted to make a statement but um you know it there's good and bad about that and so there are writers or theater makers who will address the climate crisis but don't uh, build themselves as as doing that and and so and one actually one of the contributors recently um, Aisha Jordan is working with um, at the intersection of uh, performance and permaculture and how one influenced the other and how you consider how you yeah everybody who not everybody every entity who contributes to the performance whether they're live or not are um contributors and are have an ownership in the performance so I don't I don't even think she mentions the words climate climate change anything like that in her essay but it's very much in line with um dealing with both the environmental crisis and how um we need to adjust our life and our way of working um in response to that that's a beautiful way of thinking about I think the role of curator and like how, how that is, you are an archivist in that way. It's just to see what other people are doing and say, I know this fits in. And even if, the, you know, these people aren't identifying in a way that they would pitch themselves to be a part of your series, you know that how it's connected to the overall mission of why you have created and curated the series overall. I think it's just such a beautiful role of curator and what makes me proud of this platform. I'm curious, you've all mentioned in different ways a little bit, this idea of impact. And I think it's just notoriously hard to track impact in our field overall, because, you know, we can see the little moments and how that might, you've mentioned, you know, Jordan, like someone will like learn about someone or Daphne, you mentioned someone might see themselves in, in an episode, um, but it can be hard to, to kind of track. So I'm curious, I do want to uplift um, a question we got, um, which one way we try to track impact on how around is metrics, because that is something we can do. Um, so uplifting a question, I'll pass to you, Ronan and Vijay for this, but um, what metrics are you using or able to use towards engagement? And is there more to uh, the live streaming or the on-demand? What is good or necessary numbers? So if you could talk a little bit, maybe Ramona, I'll pass to you just about that side of tracking impact. Yeah, totally. So um, I'll say for the journal in particular, our main way of uh, of sort of tracking um, engagement is by going through Google Analytics and looking at page views, um, and in particular looking at uh, like time on page um, as well. So we we look at sort of raw numbers, and then we look at people who spend fifty seconds or more um, on the page, which implies that they've read at least the first couple paragraphs, <laughs> um, which is you know a, a metric of engagement. Um, we also uh, don't necessarily track, but certainly pay attention to like social media um, 
uh, reactions, but even more than that, reshares. Um, so people, you know, posting the link on Facebook or resharing an Instagram post into their story or whatever. Um, because for me, that really tells me that someone found value in it, right? If they believe that they want to sort of put it out under their own name as well. Um, and then uh, comments on the website as well, though in, in the past years, we've seen a sort of decrease in folks commenting on on our own platform that we're actually interestingly starting to see, I think an uptick in that again, um, which I sort of hypothesize might be kind of due to the like demise of Twitter um, as a Twitter slash X, <laughs> right? There was like a good couple of years when there was like a really robust theater conversation happening on Twitter. Uh, and that is not non-existent, but it's it's just changed. And so I do think some people are coming back to native platforms. Um, but yeah, so those are the sort of like number uh, type of metrics that we look at. Um, I'll say we also uh, do a contributor survey. Um, so about six weeks or so after someone has a piece published on HowlRound, we send them a survey and we ask questions like, did you have conversations with your colleagues about this? Did you hear from people about your contribution? Can you name like any impacts that came from you? And that's the really, you know, the qualitative data um, that often really means a lot more to us, right? It's great to know that a couple hundred or a couple thousand people wrote an essay, um, but it's really impactful to hear like, you know, I was invited on a panel to speak about what I wrote about or um, I was invited, you know, I was offered a gig on a show because this person found out that my expertise was in X, Y, Z or whatever. Um, so yeah, so we just try to kind of balance those, uh, those personal stories, you know, with what we're getting in terms of numbers. Um, and we do something similar. We do survey TV producers and podcast producers as well. Um, so that's sort of similar in that way, but I'll let the Jay talk a little bit more about what, um, what engagement numbers we look at there, since that also seems to be a specific part of this question. Yeah, so we collect, of course, I mean, it's very easy to collect uh, quantitative data because all of these online tools are geared towards those, towards collecting quantitative, um, as well as like uh, geographic. Those are the two easiest things for a software to collect. Um, but those are also tools that are designed for marketing purposes. And, um, and so, uh, you know, a huge difference between what we're doing and a typical publication is that, you know, this is a digital commons and we're considering what's on the site as contributions, as gifts by, um, uh, by people who have various ideas and voices, perspectives that um, have been maybe traditionally, historically, on the margins. And now how around because people pay attention to it, they're able to have ideas that are in these corners that are now amplified and put in them in the center. And so that that um, is really, I think, the real kind of impact, or I guess the 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 health of the platform is really about um, are these are potentially Un are we, is the platform dynamics working where uh, we're uncovering and producing knowledge that traditionally wouldn't be uh, produced in, uh, say, conventional situations or conventional institutions? Uh, and so that's not really, you know, a, a thing that you can put a number to or quantify. Also, another is the, the different behaviors we have around um, producing knowledge. Uh, which I think is another way of measuring success or impact is, um, uh, you know, that um, like the the fact that with the the TV platform we're using a shared infrastructure, a shared infra, um, technical infrastructure. Like instead of seventy different organizations um, getting a subscription to say Vimeo, um, an enterprise subscription to Vimeo to live stream, which would cost say $15,000 or $10,000 for that organization. Instead, we're all collectively, that's 70 organizations using one 
um, live streaming infrastructure. So there's there's that kind of, I guess it's a political, social, cultural project here of um, figuring out how do we collectively uh, create knowledge around certain shared goals and how do we figure out these infrastructures that we can share to be much more efficient and to serve um, the needs we all have of connecting to new ideas and to uh, practitioners all around. So that, yeah, I think that's another way of looking at about looking at what um, you know successes or impact or engagement looks like. Yeah, thank you for naming that. And it made me realize also something that we didn't quite mention, which is the um, the licensing when people submit on HowlRun, if you can speak to that briefly, Vijay. Yeah. yeah, so from the beginning, we've, um, so HowlRun doesn't own anything in any kind of like technical, moral, or legal sense. Uh, we, uh, by by a contributor engaging or partnering with HowlRun or contributing, gifting to HowlRun, they're um, licensing their work uh, with a Creative Commons license. Uh, and you'll see in the footer of our um, website, the uh, intellectual um, uh, property uh, statement. Um, and it's um, and it's really a, uh, a copy left um, kind of engagement we have where uh, our goal is to spread the knowledge, the ideas, the conversation as far and wide as possible. And so the contributors to HowlRound are enabling us to be publishers of their content. And it also theoretically allows for any other publication to um, republish the work, um, uh, and which has happened a lot. For example, in the in case of academic publications where there's been an author who's written an essay and then has been very easily been able to take that essay and publish it in a larger volume with a academic publisher um, without very complicated legal things going on. Um, and yeah, and so that that using that tool of uh, Creative Commons has been really a wonderful both signaling device that um, we want to challenge and resist just the commodification of everything um, with the purpose of spreading knowledge as far and far and wide as possible. So thank you to these contributors who added to the comments <laughs> and all of your work and made things free and accessible, which is really a goal. Um, and I'll name too, Jordan had to hop off. Um, they are in London at another conference. So this is what we're talking about, global collaboration, everyone's doing the most. Um, so thank you to Jordan. Um, we have about 10 minutes left. I knew this would fly by because there's so many wonderful people on the screen. Uh, but I wonder on this um, thread of impact, I'd love to kind of move us into thinking about those tuning in who maybe have never created anything in the formats that you all have. Um, what are the sort of lessons, takeaways, things that you learned from your idea to, you know, over the course of your series, some of those skills that you think, God, I wish I knew that before I started this, that you'd want to impart to those watching. And I'll keep that one open. I can start. For me, it's been about pre-planning and having a backup plan. Making sure that there's a backup plan to, like when I was curating, right? I was like, oh, I have eight playwrights in mind. But what if those playwrights can't make it happen, right? Like what if one of those eight people cannot do it? So again, if I'm curating and I'm being cognizant of age, location, um, their national countries of origin, like I... I have to have backups to the backups. And so that I learned really fast. Like as soon as like, I was not thinking about that. So as soon as like two people that I had in mind, either one didn't respond and the other one couldn't, I was like, oh. <laughs> and so in moving forward, having that, and, and I have a series, Julie and I, I uh, already sort of pitched and I was like, oh, I'm gonna pitch it, pitch it for real. You know, that I can't wait to, to do the next series. It is completely different, but just coming up with something else, um, I'm excited to sort of think about. So the pre-planning and giving yourself time, right? So like if you are going to launch like myself, something that's live, giving yourself time so that you can design things, giving yourself time. Well, it was how round y'all the ones who designed. That was amazing. 
um, but also giving time to send things um, publicly to people so they can sign up and they can register, they can know the marketing process, which y'all are really great at as well. But having time for that, as well as like getting these people locked in one or two months before it even starts. Always time. <laughs> I guess I'll jump in um, since I am the technical brains of uh, Daughters of Lorraine. I will say that we have grown. Oh, have we grown? And how round has been more than open about allowing that growth to happen. So when Jordan says, don't listen to our first episode, content wise, it's a fantastic episode, right? Like, however, I was like, this is great content. Oh my God, we're so excited about it. But the audio was not the best. <laughs> so if you listen to our first episode from the episode, from our most recent episode, we have really grown in what it means to like collect sound, right? So now I know you don't do sound in a big room. Sometimes we were recording in closets like <laughs> with our mics talking, right? Because sound could be absorbed by the clothes in the closet, right? We were thinking about, okay, well, what's the proper hookup um, that we need? So we used mics that we rented from the library, podcast mic to record it. Um, small things like when we moved, when I moved away from my first job and, and Jordan was still um, in Maryland, it was like, okay, now we have to learn how to collect audio on Zoom, okay? Zoom audio is not the same quality that you're gonna get if you're in person. So how can we capture that audio? Okay, we're gonna use QuickTime. Everyone usually has QuickTime on their phone and then they'll record. So then if we talk over each other, we'll have our separate recording and then I can sort of like edit that out. So a lot of it was really learning how to do those things um, and being in the process of those. And I think one of the sort of big things that I really enjoyed or I enjoy about doing the podcast is that not only was it great content wise, but it allowed me to grow a skill set that I'm very much comfortable in when collecting that um, audio and then also editing it. Like I know how to edit audio. Um, and if you want to edit audio, it takes a long time. So take breaks in between because your ear will become fatigued and you won't be able to catch uh, the things that you need to catch within it. So those are sort of my takeaways of, of, of the experience of Daughters of Lorraine. I know for you, Chantal, you've been like writing was something you were used to, but I'm curious with this like, kind of curation and the, the series process, what are some of the, the lessons you've learned? Well, definitely like definitely like Daphne said, planning, um, you know, you I don't know. I started with this much planning and then I realized, oh, no, I need this much. And then, oh, no, I need this much planning. <laughs> so that was a learning curve. Um and I'm sure um, my editing skills have improved. Um, I learned from, like very personally, I learned from everybody's contribution, you know, the way they express themselves and what they see in their work and the way they write about it. So um, I take I take that from uh, bringing all these people together. Um, and, and I think I'm probably, I've probably learned to, um understand how to put something together better like who is a right fit um how how can i approach something that's cohesive but from a lot of different angles um yeah how to create something cohesive but um diverse at the same time yeah and then, yeah, and I don't know what else. I'm sure I'm sure there's a lot more, but I don't, you know, it happens so incrementally that um, I don't necessarily remember. I would have to to somehow be able to put myself in in my own shoes ten years ago and see what the what the difference is. I honestly, I encourage you and also uh, those watching now or in the future just to go back through like and um. We can share the, the information. I don't know, Monroe, if you can pop it in the chat, actually, what each um, each of the series are. But there's just so much incredible content. And I encourage everyone to go through, not only just to consume really wonderful, engaging content, but to see like what we've talked about, this kind of change in the field through this work in particular. It's an incredible resource. Um, I'm curious for you, Ramona and Vijay, any sort of kind of what, what would you tell someone who's hoping to create content in any of these formats? Um, any lessons from your editorial, curatorial perspectives? 
Yeah. I don't know if it's a lesson, but just the thing that I always want to like offer people is just encouragement, you know, not to be intimidated. Um, our team is friendly. Uh, if you're interested in writing for the journal, our editors are really generous. Um, you know, what we're really trying to do is amplify like folks' voices and their knowledge. Um, we're not, you know, we're, we're not trying to, um, uh, like to flatten or to to shape in a specific way, but to really just amplify and platform um, the incredible knowledge that's already in our field, right? And everybody is an expert in something, like even someone who's just fresh out of a training program is an expert in that training program, right? And there's very possibly something very interesting to be said <laughs> about that. Um, so yeah, I would just say, you know, I hope that... Um, that if anybody's sitting there with like a half formed idea that they consider, um, you know, bringing it to us, the contribute content form uh, is just the start of a conversation. Um, so you don't have to come with like, you know, the most beautiful fully formed draft that you've ever written that looks exactly like something else you've read on HowlRound. Um, it's totally fine to come with an idea and we would really love to hear it. Yeah, I would just add that in addition to you know um, proposing new content, there's also uh, we have because this archive is so large now, after more than a decade of thousands and thousands of pieces of of essays and videos and podcasts, um, the need to um, to to organize that, to curate that, to uh, make sense of that in ways that uh, that we don't know about. And um, and so we do have on our contribute content form, you know, a little section for um, like some other idea that that doesn't go into our normal kind of content streams that uh, that we'd love to hear ideas about. Um, and oftentimes this you know takes takes on the form of maybe um, a professor or instructor coming up making a syllabus and sharing that. Um, that's one you know uh, one way. There could be other ways, like someone someone may want to publish a um, series of books or uh, small books on particular topics um, in a way that uh, that we wouldn't just uh, curate a book. Like we did one book, which was an anthology based on chronology, but there could be other ways of thinking about book publishing, um, print books. Um, so yeah, there's that, that really strong need of, um, of people who have that particular interest or skill or talent in in um, in making sense of what's there, as it's it's an incredible um, archive wealth, uh, incredible source of wealth and of conversation out there. Yeah, thank you for that. And I think overall, just what I was so excited to highlight with you all in this session is just that the the act or the impulse of recording these these conversations, these ideas, bring in people you admire or friends to have these conversations written, audio, live streamed is a part of the work of changing our field and disrupting our field, changing who is represented and who's highlighted. That's what we're all doing here. And just, you don't have to know how to do it yet. That's what we really want to encourage you to do. If you have that impulse, you want to make our field more progressive, more connected. Um, it starts like this, maybe some bad audio or just the hope of, of changing something. So um, hopefully, like, please reach out to us at HowlRound if you are interested in doing something like this. My email is julia at HowlRound.com. Let's chat. But we've also said HowlRound.com. We've got, we've got the links if you want to contribute something or to do it on your own and we can amplify. Um, so thank you so much to all of you watching and tuning in. Thank you. And extra, extra thank you to our incredible panelists. Thank you, Daphne, Chantal, Leticia, Jordan over in London, Vijay, Ramona. And thank you to uh, Monroe and Thea, our our own staff who helped put all this together. So thank you so much. Have a wonderful rest of your conference. And we'll see you over on HowlRound. <laughs>